this week I'm going to talk about um, one thing only, uh, essentially how big a problem is climate change. So in the first block I talked about the implications of greenhouse gas emission reduction, where the emissions came from and how to reduce emissions. Uh, this block I'm going to talk about the implications of climate change and then in the third block I'm going to bring it uh, back together and we're going to do a cost-benefit analysis of greenhouse gas emission reduction. Uh, but these four weeks we're only going to talk about uh, the impacts of climate change. The impacts of climate change are many uh, and they're diverse. There's different places uh, to start uh, this but perhaps a logical place is to start with plants and animals. So climate change would bring different temperatures, would bring different rainfall, would bring different wind, would of course also bring a different composition uh, of the atmosphere uh, that is what driving uh, anthropogenic climate change. Um, <clears throat> and then everything that would be exposed to this would immediately be affected uh, and have to change. And one way of picturing this is to see yourself driving in a car from, say, the Netherlands down to Spain, and if you would do that, uh, and presumably some of you have done uh, similar things, then you would change the vet you would see the vegetation slowly change around you. Right? Plants that uh, grow happily uh, in England uh, would be less happy uh, growing in Spain, uh, and vice versa. Right? And that is because temperature is different, rainfall is different radiation is different, and so on and so forth. And in, in the future, these things would be different in the same location, and then you would expect a uh, different interpretation. So, um, people have tried to model this, um, and what you're looking at here in the top picture is model agreements on changes in biomes. So this is whole, wholesale um, ecosystem essentially uh, and the, there's a whole bunch of models that model vegetation in relation to climate um, I actually don't know how many <coughs> what you're looking at here is not so much the change but the model agreement uh, so the darker the color uh, the more models agree uh, that you would see a shift in biome and biome is sort of a large complex uh, of species, so a savanna would be uh, a biome or a boreal forest would be a biome, right? So we're not talking about individual species, we're talking about uh, whole ecosystems here. And what you see is that in many parts of the world, basically all the assessments that have been done, regardless of model parameterization, regardless of climate scenario and so on and so forth, uh, you would see fairly substantial changes in uh, ecosystems and that is exactly uh, what you would expect. We can put a bit more structure uh, on this than just to say that in the future nature will look different than it does today. One thing um, that uh, you can say is that uh, the specialized are most likely to lose out if climate changes uh, and the marginalized either see a big expansion of their range or um, we'll see a local extinction and the marginalized are those species that sort of live at the edges of their ecological needs. So two things can happen, either their ecological needs can disappear, if it gets a little bit warmer or a little bit colder and sort of hanging on to the very existence uh, already or of course it may be a bit too cold for them and they're heading, uh, hanging on to the cold edges of their ecological needs and then warming would actually see a a uh, large increase um, in uh, their rates. Uh, specialized are the sort of plants and animals that occupy a very specific uh, ecological niche. And that may just disappear. Um, one example would be Edelweiss, which is a plant grows in a lot of uh, English gardens. Uh, but only uh, closely supervised and protected by humans in its natural habitat it grows at the top of a mountain and particularly it grows in the Alps um, and it not, doesn't grow there because it particularly likes it there 
you sort of see very extreme temperature ranges, very hot to very cold, of course very high levels of radiation because there's less uh, atmosphere to protect it. And uh, the reason that Edelweiss grows there is because it's the only plant that can grow there and Edelweiss cannot compete with other plants. If it gets warmer, what would Edelweiss need to do? It would need to move north. And there's two problems with that. First, you want to move from one mountain top to the next mountain top, you need to travel through the valley. And it cannot because there's other plants well growing in the valleys and it cannot compete with those plants, so it cannot easily move from one mountain top to uh, the other. Um, but of course, there would be winds to assist uh, the seeds, not the plants, right? Uh, the second bigger problem with Edelweiss is that it grows in the Alps and if the Alps get too hot for Edelweiss or too dry for Edelweiss then it would need to move to the next mountain range and that is all the way in Norway so it would need to cross the German plains and there's all sorts of other plants growing there and it simply cannot make it through that distance so a plant that occupies a very specific ecological niche, climate then changes, takes away its existing ecological niche, it would need to travel to the next one that may not be there, that may not be reachable, and uh, the consequence is local uh, extinction. In the case of Edelweiss, it would not be global extinction because it's such an iconic plant. It would be protected somewhere, but it may disappear uh, in the wild. Um, <coughs> So, whereas generalists, the sort of plants and animals that you see everywhere, because they can live everywhere, chances are they will also be able to live everywhere in the future, right? Uh, so you would need to be less worried about generalists than you would need to be about specialists. Now, does this matter for humans? Yes. If you look at what do people value when they go for nature walks or hikes or whatever, it's the special plants. It's not the plants that you see everywhere that people care about. It's the rare things that people care about. Climate change uh, would also affect uh, rainfall and therefore water resources. I uh, talked about droughts, droughts and floods already. Uh, shown in this uh, picture here, it's a bit of a bad picture. Uh, red is essentially good and blue is bad uh, on this map. Uh, so the starting point is the 100 year flood, the flood that you can expect to occur every century, or rather that every year would occur with a 1 in 100 uh, chance. Now what happens to the 1 in 100 year flood, uh, depending where you are, uh, in red they would become less frequent, go from 1 in 100 to 1 in 1000 for the reddest color, so that is actually a good thing, right? these things become rarer. And whereas in blue you're looking at uh, areas in the world where the one in the flood that would now occur every century uh, may occur every decade or perhaps every year for the darkest blue. Um, and of course uh, we are here. Um, and what you would see that in, in England, uh, or actually throughout Great Britain, uh, you would see an increase in flood risks. Um, and that is because there's more water, but it's likely that more water will fall uh, in winter. There's other impacts, um, you're going to have to do with water as well. Uh, if it gets warmer, you would increase evaporation, so the water supply would fall, but at the same time you get thirsty, so water demand would increase, and it's not just humans that get more thirsty, but it's animals and plants as well. Uh, so you would want to use uh, more water for irrigation. Uh, if it's warmer, you would also want to use more water for cooling uh, purposes. So power plants essentially generate a lot of heat. The way we make sure that these plants don't overheat is that essentially we pour cold water on them. And that is why you see so many power plants located either near the sea or near rivers or sometimes lakes and that's because there is a lot of cooling water uh, readily available there. And now the, the, the whole purpose of cooling water is that you have a hot turbine and you pour on cold water. If the water gets warmer 
then cooling would be less effective and you would need to pour on more water to achieve the same cooling. Um, of course, if the temperature is higher, then the temperature of your cooling water would also be higher. There's other uh, problems there, there as well. During recent heat waves in France, they had to shut down a number of nuclear power plants. Not so much because it was impossible to cool, but rather because it was illegal to cool. In order to protect um, nature, particularly fish and other animals that live in uh, the receiving waters, the waters that is being discharged from the power plants, uh, in order to protect um, these animals and plants, there are restrictions on the temperature of the discharged uh, cooling water. It simply cannot be uh, too hot. And for that reason, it's not that they could not cool the nuclear power plants anymore, it's just that the, the discharged cooling water would be too hot uh, compared to the legal limit. And therefore, they have to shut uh, these power plants down. Um, <coughs> There's not so much uh, a big problem in France at the moment. Peak demand for electricity in France is like it is in England uh, in winter. Um, these sort of events that cooling water becomes too hot is something that would happen in summer. Uh, so there's not really a uh, choice uh, there. It's, it's not a big deal. You can close down these power plants because demand for electricity is not that high anyway. In the future, that may be different. If you look at California, if you look at Florida, then peak demand for electricity is actually in summer rather than in winter. And that is because peak demand for electricity is not determined by Christmas lights, but it's determined by air conditioning. And it may, of course, be that in a hotter future, more European buildings will be air conditioned. And we see that already in modern office buildings, that they are typically air conditioned. Uh, but air conditioning will likely spread to homes as well. And that would imply that the peak demand for electricity in the future will fall in summer rather than in winter. And then, of course, going back to the example of France, if your cooling water becomes too hot in summer, if that would coincide with your peak demand for electricity, then you're in trouble, right? And essentially, you have to choose between uh, plunging Paris into darkness or frying fish, right? <coughs> you can sort of imagine what choice uh, the French authorities would make, but at the moment it would be illegal. Like at the moment the law says we'd rather have a blackout in Paris than fried fish. So climate change affects uh, energy production through cooling, but also we generate a lot of electricity by wind at the moment. If the winds would be different, then production of electricity would be different. I talked about consumption, also electricity transmission would be harder in the future because if your wires get hotter, the resistance to electricity becomes uh, greater, so there's issues there. Uh, climate change would obviously affect uh, tourism. The reason that we go to Spain on holiday is not because we like the food so much, uh, but because we like the predictably stable and nice weather uh, in uh, Spain. Of course. It may be that in the future, Spain, like Greece at the moment in August, for many people from Britain, is already too hot. It may well be that in a few decades from now, northern Spain, Barcelona, will become too hot to be bearable for uh, your average uh, Englishman or woman. <coughs> and then people would spend their holidays elsewhere, right? And of course, Dorset has beautiful beaches as well, right? But lousy weather, and it may be that in 50 years' time from now, uh, people would come to the English Riviera rather than go to the French Riviera for their holidays. Um, <coughs> so, major shifts in tourism. The tourists probably wouldn't care that much, but of course, the tourist operators that are locally bound would care. Greek would lose a lot of revenue, perhaps, uh, people in Spain would lose a lot of revenue. Go ahead. Is tourism already responding to um, climate change to increase in temperature? Or is it predicted to respond in the future? Uh, there's little evidence of beach resorts responding to 
climate change in terms of warming. There is lots of evidence that they are responding to beach erosion. Uh, this comes from sea level rise, I'll come back to that. Whereas in the uh, ski resorts, you see massive investments in uh, snow making equipment as well as a shift to indoors uh, skiing. So yeah, there is, depending on what particular subsector you're looking at, there is evidence of adaptation to climate change already. The construction sector would be effective, uh, affected if it's during frost, uh, there's no construction in this part of the world, that would be uh, less common in the future. Transport would be affected, mm, fog, floods, all those things. And uh, you should not forget about labor productivity. Um, the human body, we are warm-blooded animals. We need to keep our internal temperature at 38 degrees Celsius. There's a lot of things going on in your body. Your heart is beating and your uh, stomach is working and your liver is working and uh, your brain is working even though uh, that doesn't always show. Uh, there's a lot of activity going on in your body and that generates a lot of heat and that needs to be discharged uh, to the environment, otherwise your body overheats. Uh, and that means that the ideal temperature for the human body, if you're not wearing much clothes and you're not doing much, uh, would be an environment of 25 degrees. That sort of is the lowest energy state of the human body. And if it gets, of course, if you're doing things, if you're running or you're uh, chopping uh, wood or uh, you're uh, harvesting grains or whatever, you're working hard, then of course your body uh, becomes hotter and you need to discharge more energy. The way we do that is by sweating, mostly. And essentially what you do is you secrete water and that evaporates and that evaporation then actually cools you, right? Now, if the environment is hotter, then sweating becomes less effective. And of course, if it's more humid, then evaporating water becomes more difficult. Uh, which is why in a very, on a very hot and humid day, you don't feel so energetic. Like your body simply has to slow down, otherwise you start overheating inside. Not so much a big issue uh, in England, right? Uh, but for people who do hard farm labor in Thailand, this is a big deal already. And it may well be that in a 50 years time, the ability of the body to do hard manual labor in places like Southeast Asia will be 40% or so below what it is today. And that immediately translates into labor productivity. And a 40% drop in labor productivity would imply that you can command a 40% lower wage. Right? Uh, so these are uh, big issues uh, in some parts of the world. Uh, so there's all these impacts. didn't talk <laughs> about agriculture uh, at all. I did talk about plants. Uh, if uh, plants that are growing out in the wild would do better or worse with regard to climate, then the same is true that for plants that grow on farms. And here we're looking at uh, the three most important crops in the sense that they this is where we get our calories from. Uh, that is maize, that is wheat, uh, and that is rice. Um, for different scenarios of climate change, uh, as we move to the right, uh, climate change becomes more pronounced, and then for the temperate parts of the world, and for the tropical parts of the world. Um, and then the dots are all the studies that have been published, or have been published in 2014. Um, and then the lines are sort of curves uh, fitted uh, to this. And then in red, uh, we are looking at the case where we assume that farmers keep doing the same thing as they've always done. They keep planting the same crop at the same time, harvested at the same time, apply the same fertilizers, uh, pesticides uh, at the same time and the same amount of irrigation. And then what you see is uh, fairly uh, negative uh, results that uh, basically all crops everywhere uh, go down. Uh, there's an exception here. Oh, wait, no. Uh, and then in blue, uh, we're looking at scenarios with adaptation where farmers do respond to what is going on <coughs> uh, around them. And then we typically see 
uh, less less dramatic impacts, <coughs> but still you'd see very uh, negative ones in some parts, but also positive uh, impacts in other parts. The reason uh, that this blue curve falls below the red curve rather than above, that is farmers actually self-harm, is a suggestion here, rather than that they change their way so that they get uh, better off here, they're changing the way so that they get worse off. That's a sample selection issue. Uh, the clowns that make uh, these pictures did not pay attention during their undergraduate statistics class. This is essentially the explanation uh, here. So you would see um, fairly substantial changes in agriculture, just as you would see uh, in nature, as you would expect. And some are clearly negative, some are uh, perhaps positive. There's others that sort of go through uh, a mixture of positive and negative. And these are just the three uh, main crops. Um, it is perhaps better to look at some sort of super indicator of all this. Uh, what you're looking at here is the world food price. So this through international trade as well as national trade, through substitution between what you want to eat and what you want to grow and so on and so forth, uh, integrates the sort of impact of climate change and agriculture again, this is a scenario of climate change. These are food prices, wholesale prices actually. Uh, so negative here, if you fall below 100, the price is falling, which means that crops are growing better greater supply, demand roughly the same, so prices fall. Uh, so this is good, at least for consumers, uh, and if you're above 100, then you're uh, not so, uh, that's not so good, right? Because then essentially supply falls and it drives up the price. And you see um, five scenarios, five different models looking uh, at the same thing. Some models say that initially climate change uh, will be good, and other models say, you know, climate change will always be bad. All models agree that in the very long run, if you see a lot of climate change, uh, then global food production will be hampered. Now, why do some models say that initially climate change will be good? Um, since it goes back to the previous picture that I showed, if you look at different places, different crops, then you can see just a mix of uh, responses, right? Some plants like it hot, some plants uh, don't like it hot. So there's a mix of responses. The main reason, however, why the initial impacts would be beneficial for global agriculture is to do with CO2 fertilization. Uh, so the whole driver of climate change is that there's more CO2 in the atmosphere. CO2 is also the basis, or one of the basis, for photosynthesis. If there's more CO2 in the atmosphere, there's more for plants to photosynthesize. And in that sense, CO2 is a fertilizer to plants. More CO2 uh, is good. And there's a more subtle effect there, but perhaps a more important effect. And that has to do with the water efficiency of plants. So one way of picturing photosynthesis is that plants have little mouths on their leaves, and they use that to take CO2 out of the atmosphere, essentially grab CO2. These mouths are not mouths in the way that you have a mouth, but they're, uh, they're called stomata. Uh, but the stomata can open and close. And just as like you wake up with a dry mouth if you have slept with your mouth open, plants lo lose a lot of water if they have to keep their stomata open. And if they can take the CO2 more quickly, they can close their stomata and keep the water in. And that means that in dry areas, if there's more CO2 in the atmosphere, plants become much more drought resistant. And that explains uh, a large part of the initially positive effects of climate change in agriculture. And this is, of course, a particularly a boon to farmers in dry areas, right? So it's, again, it's not so much an issue for England, uh, but if you're sort of in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, then this may actually uh, be very uh, good for you. I talked a little bit about the impacts of climate change on labor productivity and that we need to keep the temperature of our body at that 38 uh, degrees C. For you guys, you're all young for sure, hopefully you're all healthy. 
the heat stress, I mean, if on a very hot day you just feel a bit tired, uh, but that's it. But if you are very young, six months old or very old, 92 or above, or you have a heart disease or something wrong uh, with your cardiovascular or respiratory system, then heat stress is life-threatening. And your body simply can't cope with the extra work it has to do to keep yourself cool. And then the choice is between either heart failure because you work too hard or organ failure, failure because it gets too hot. Right? Uh, so heat stress is a real issue for the very young, the very old, uh, and those suffering cardiovascular and respiratory disease. And if it gets hotter in the future, you will see more cases of heat stress. At the same time, we also need to keep our body at the 38 degrees when it's very cold out. So also then your body needs to work harder. And, and that means that if winters get warmer in the future, then you would see less cases of cold stress. Now, cold stress is not nearly as important as heat stress, but it is the case that in places like the UK, many poor people die in winter than they do in summer. And that has to do with infectious diseases. If it's cold out, we spend more time indoors, and that typically means that we spend more time in closer proximity to other human beings. And that means that all sorts of infectious diseases get a much better chance of uh, uh, making us ill. And that would suggest that in a future warmer climate, we would see less of these uh, events uh, than we see now. And in places like the UK, the reduction in cold-related deaths is an order of magnitude larger than the expected increase in heat-related deaths, at least during this uh, century. Um, I talked a little bit about how different plants uh, and animals would respond to climate change. It also goes for critters such as mosquitoes, and I'll come back to uh, this next week. Uh, a lot of these diseases that you see, you see shifted, uh, listed here, malaria, <coughs> dengue, schisto, and so on and so forth, <coughs> are tropical diseases, which immediately suggests that if conditions get hotter and better, they would expand their range, uh, and uh, perhaps their prevalence as well. We keep food in the fridge so that it doesn't spoil. There's always issues with sort of outdoor food markets and how long will uh, they be able to keep uh, their water and their uh, meat and everything sort of disease free. Food spoils faster if it's warmer, so you would expect more food poisonings and so on and so forth uh, in uh, the future. All these things um, will uh, happen. Sea level rise, last but certainly not least. The atmosphere warms, the ocean will warm, the ocean warms, water expands, and uh, sea level will rise. Uh, that means that your beaches will erode faster, your cliffs will also erode faster. Land gets inundated, unless, of course, you spend money on growing things <coughs> and what have you. Right? Wetlands in front of the coast may or may not be able to keep up with sea level rise. They essentially need to increase the rate of sedimentation to keep up or move inland. And essentially, current agricultural land is converted into wetland, uh, which would happen naturally unless, of course, we decide to protect that agricultural land by building a dike and then wetlands sort of get squeezed. A lot of people worry um, about and the impacts of sea level rise on small islands, particularly atoll uh, islands, people say will within the century completely disappear uh, below the sea. Um, that is not their main concern really. It's true that by the end of the century, large parts of the Maldives and the Seychelles and places like that will uh, have disappeared unless we uh, raise the islands. Uh, but a much bigger worry there is salt water intrusion. Atoll islands have a salt water, a fresh, wa uh, fresh water land, sorry, <laughs> below the surface, which is essentially rainwater that sort of is now has become groundwater. If sea level rises, then the pressure of the salt water of the sea on the fresh water lands increases, and that means that the 
salt water will seep into the groundwater. And that is a process that will be much, much faster than the island disappearing gradually under the level of the sea. Within the coming decades, a lot of these places will simply lose their fresh groundwater and everything will be brackish uh, or worse. Same is true for an island like England, right? But here, this, this sort of the brackishness of the groundwater will probably intrude by 100 meters or so. Which is fairly small relative to an island the size of Great Britain. Of course, if you're a small island, then it is fairly big. Uh, and they will be driven off their islands <coughs> because of lack of groundwater long before fresh groundwater, long before the island disappears under the sea. Adaptation in all impacts of climate change is terribly important. And uh, I just can't stress this uh, enough. So here we have a beach. Uh, here is this woman lying. Uh, on the beach and her head is only 30 centimeters or so, one foot above the water. So with half a meter of sea level rise, she will drown, right? And the same goes for the people here and these people here. They're all in mortal uh, danger. No, they're not, right? Sea level rise, half a meter, will take many decades. Very few people spend more than a few hours on the beach. Even if people come back the next day to the same beach, they do not necessarily lie in the same spot. Even if whole families go to the same beach, you will not insist on lying in the same spot at the beach as your granny did 50 years ago. Right? And you will definitely not do that when you sort of like see that the spot that where your grandmother used to lie to sunbathe is now covered in water. You will not insist on to lie in the same spot, right? People have eyes and ears and they sort of notice that, hmm, the beach is gone, maybe I should go sunbathe somewhere else. The reason that I raise this is that there's actually a lot of scientific literature that makes the assumption that people will continue to do the same thing even if climate has changed, even if it's completely stupid and obviously stupid that they will continue to do the same thing that farmers will continue to plant the same crops even after it's failed and failed and failed and failed uh, for decades in a row they will continue trying because that is what grandpa did that is not how people are, right? Uh, people do stupid things, but they're not so incredibly stupid, uh, as assumed in many of the impact models. <coughs> and adaptation matters, and adaptation matters a great deal. Okay, we're looking at a confusing picture. <laughs> uh, it's about the impacts of sea level rise. Let's just focus um, on the... How does this work again? The... Uh, we need to contrast the red to the red, or the blue to the blue, or the green to the green. Well, then let's just focus uh, on this one here. Uh, what you're looking at here is the number of people without any sea level rise uh, that would be flooded. And this is a very expensive definition of flooding. This is people who get their heads wet as well as people who just get their toes wet. Right? So anybody who experiences some sort of uh, flooding. It's at the moment, and this is a logarithmic scale, it's about 500, no, about 50 million people uh, per year. And then with a meter sea level rise, and this is a logarithmic scale, that would go up to about 600 million per year. And this is under the assumption that coastal protection doesn't change. The dikes are as they are. Um, now, if we look at the second scenario, the dashed line, um, there the assumption is that dikes are improved, but so as to keep the protection standard the same. And then you see less dramatic impacts, but still fairly uh, dramatic. Um, and then the dotted line uses the assumption that as people grow richer, they will protect themselves better against uh, floods. So in a place like London, because of the Thames barrier, uh, people are actually fairly well protected against floods, and that is because there is so much wealth uh, in London that it actually makes sense to 
spend money on such an expensive thing as the tent barrier. The assumption here is that the protection level uh, stays the same. And here what it says, well, London is fairly well protected. We can assume that in the future it will continue to be fairly well protected. But if you look at a place like Lagos, there's no coastal protection to speak of. Lagos is bang on the coast. It's extremely vulnerable to uh, floods. And here the assumption is that in the future, even if Lagos has become fairly wealthy, it will continue to have no coastal protection. Whereas here the assumption is that Lagos uh, will be protected, much like, say, Ankara or Lisbon is uh, today. Not quite up to London standards, uh, <coughs> but uh, definitely better than it is today. And the difference is big, right? The difference is between 600 mil million people flooded per year and perhaps only 50 million people flooded per year. The reason that they don't start in the same place is because some modelers are just not very clued in, right? Yeah. The past should, of course, be identical, regardless of your assumptions about the future. Uh, but not everybody has that in their message. But you see that adaptation can make a difference of an order of magnitude. I've given you sort of an overview of all the physical impacts of climate change. Some are small, some are big, some are positive, some are negative, some are positive for some people but negative for others. Uh, sea level rise you may see as an overall negative, but of course if you're a coastal engineer then it's a great business opportunity. So there's this whole long list of impacts, uh, all very different and you can't really make sense. Uh, so what you need to do in order to answer the question is climate change a big problem or a small problem? And of course you need to answer that question before you can ask and answer the question, so what should we do about it? You need to somehow aggregate these impacts into a super indicator. Now, <coughs> this picture shows alternative super indicators. And the reason that I show alternative super indicators is that the choice of super, I mean, whenever you aggregate, you always lose information, right? But the choice of information that you lose essentially determines what super indicator you go for. So this is not a matter of right or wrong, this is a matter of taste and attitude. And there are here four alternative super indicators, even though they're numbered one to five. Uh, they go back to the third assessment report of the IPCC. And the reasoning is something as follows. If you are the sort of person who worries about uh, unique systems and the very vulnerable, uh, then climate change is a big worry. If you're the sort of person who worries about what climate change would do to butterflies, then climate change is a big deal. Because there's actually been already documented cases of local extinctions of butterfly species because of climate change. You may wonder why, right? Butterflies can fly, why don't they just fly with the climate? If the climate moves north, why don't the butterflies just follow? Uh, the reason is that butterflies have, some species of butterflies, have great difficulty crossing wide open spaces. And if you're a small butterfly, then a road is a wide open space. And they may simply not be able to move uh, north with uh, the climate, and as I said, there's been documented uh, cases of extinction. If you're the sort of person who worries about that, or if you worry about what would happen to um, indigenous cultures on atoll islands, then climate change is a big deal, right? Because these things will disappear in, in the future, maybe somewhere here. <clears throat> uh, you may also be the sort of person who says, well, uh, nature evolves, and uh, small things always get lost, Let's just focus on the big picture and we worry about wholesale changes in ocean currents. We worry about such things as Greenland melting or West, Ar West Antarctica sliding into sea. Uh, then you would be uh, in this category. And then climate change is much less of a worry because these things will not happen this century and may not even happen this millennium. And we actually also don't really know how emission reduction would affect the chance uh, of this, and there's even suggestions that emission reduction would increase the chance of instability of high seas. Uh, so that is what drives you, that is what keeps you up at night, then you should go back to sleep because climate change is not a big deal. The things that I'll be talking about 
come mostly tomorrow, much less today, and then I planned, are what happens to Everett's human well-being uh, and what happens to them. And then we'll see the climate change is not such a big deal. Uh, and what happens to the income distribution. And then climate change is a greater concern. And in order to answer this question, what does climate change do to human well-being, human welfare, we need to monetize these impacts, right? We need to <coughs> go through the long list of all the impacts that I sketched and say what is their value in human terms. And I'm going to do that and express this in uh, money. And uh, last term, George explained why you would want to do monetary valuation. Here are some reasons. Um, and he also talked about uh, the various methods uh, that are available to do monetary valuation, from uh, revealed preference methods such as travel costs, how much are you spending uh, to travel to enjoy Brighton uh, Beach, for instance. In your case, uh, you would not be spending a whole lot <coughs> for that. Some of you may have traveled to Bondi Beach, right, which is uh, much more exciting. And the fact that you're willing to spend uh, so much money is an, indicating, an indicator of the differential excited, excitement at Brighton and Bondi. He also said that these revealed preference methods are sort of said that you have the right data and you're a good econometrician are relatively robust but also relatively limited because you only can value direct consumption values. You cannot value existence values or request values or option values. And for those sort of uh, things, we have stated preference methods, contingent valuation, contingent choice, uh, which are much broader in their application, but at the same time suffer from all sorts of biases that come in trying to measure that respondents may to try and game uh, your interview. Uh, they may simply not know uh, the value. They may respond to the interviewer. And of course, the, the big issue there is that you're not asking people to put their money on the table so they can essentially answer uh, whatever uh, pops into their head and they do not necessarily think uh, about what uh, they're talking about. And so there's issues with manipulations, there's issue with uh, unfamiliar 